I'm a student, artist, and researcher from Northwestern University. This year, I did a project on the ways in which humans impact the landscape, specifically looking at things that seem natural, um, but really are kind of artificial, like artificial waterfronts or land moved for agriculture or homesteading. Um, and I pursued this project because I really want to challenge the viewer of my artwork to notice the ways in which they reshape their landscapes uh, through the food they consume, the products they purchase, and the way they live their daily life. Um, so specifically in pursuing this project, I embroidered photographs, and I did this for a couple of reasons. Um, but in addition to embroidering photographs, I use natural pigment, and that's arguably the more important uh, part of my practice. So I use natural pigment for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first, I wanted to make it really clear that the image in the artwork was a real place. I think when we see art in a gallery, it's really easy to, to separate ourselves from the landscape or the thing depicted, and I didn't want that to be as easy for these pieces. The second reason I wanted to use natural pigment was because it would innovate on the practice of overpainting. And overpainting is what I meant when I said I embroider photographs. It's a 19th century photo alteration technique originally uh, created to add color to black and white photographs, ostensibly to make them more realistic. It's been done with a variety of mediums like paint, charcoal, uh, and graphite, uh, but embroidery is a new take on it, and natural pigments even more so. Um, I think there's something really interesting about using pigment from the landscape to recolor the landscape uh, in an effort to make it more realistic. Um, and then the third reason that I wanted to use natural pigments was to create a slow production and consumption practice. I wanted to foster a, a sense of reverence for the landscapes that I've depicted, and I think that I did that um, in pursuing this project. So for this poster, I want to focus in on a specific image and case study. You can see it um, here, and this is a piece uh, called Drenched in Iron, and it depicts a recently harvested pine plantation. And I want to give you a little bit of background on pine plantation farming uh, just to level the playing field. Um, so at least in Mississippi, pine plantation farming didn't really start until the mid-18th century. Uh, before that, uh, the forests were commercially untouched, though cleared for homesteads and settlements. Um, but between the mid-18th century and the early 1900s, logging gradually picked up. Uh, and then in the early 19th century, when paper pulp was kind of discovered and its uses were, were explored, um, pine production in Mississippi just shot up. And by the 1930s, our pine forests were decimated. Uh, the land was pretty much useless for agriculture, so we abandoned it. Uh, and the land just kind of stayed fallow um, until the 1950s when there was a change in the tax codes to make it profitable again to farm. So people were suddenly trying to figure out how are we going to grow trees on these areas that have been just decimated by poor farming practices. Um, and that's actually the case for the place that you see right here. So this picture was taken in Carroll County, Mississippi, uh, and pine farming has been going on in the area for at least 80 years, so probably longer at this exact site. Um, and pine farming is a 40-year cycle. So you can direct your attention to the little diagram I have on the poster um, where it talks about the stages. So farming trees starts with something called preparation, and there's two types. There's mechanical and chemical. Chemical is like a spraying of herbicides, but mechanical preparation has a lot to do with the soil. Um, so some of the techniques that have been tried, and it's really been a trial and error process, are clearing, subzoning, burning, root raking, shearing, and disking. Um, and all of these processes are supposed to leave the barren site more similar to an old field, something that's ready to be seeded. Um, but in truth, they contribute to erosion and, and soil damage. And that's some of what I've listed down below. Some of the effects of this preparatory stage are loss of topsoil and nutrient depletion and compacting and acidification and increased soil temperature. And these aren't necessarily good things. In fact, they're usually bad things. Um, so for this image in particular, I thought it was so important uh, to use natural pigment in telling the story of the scene. Um, because I, I think the connection between the damage that's done by the farming practices depicted and the use of the material um, are just a really uh, intimate look at the situation. So that kind of gets me to the specific soil that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and in the interest of leveling the playing field, I want to give the soil equation really quick. Uh, so soil is created through a bunch of factors, including climate, the organisms of a given location, the relief, which is like the topography, uh, the parent material, and then time. So the specific soil that we're going to talk about is called Providence Silt Loam. Um, and you can see on the map over here, um, the Carroll County is, is outlined, and the place that I took the soil from is from this like L shape on the left hand side. Um, anyways, but going back to the type of soil that's in this area, um, I want to start with the parent material because I think that understanding the geography of the region and the parent material kind of helps you understand a bit more how pine plantation farming came to be so prominent. So this part of Mississippi uh, is part of the upper coastal plain uh, from the Atlantic seaboard and then it's also part of the upper thin lowest hills which are a, a structure that kind of goes up through the state in like a backward sea. Um, but these features were formed several, several thousand years ago from windblown glacial outwash. Uh, they're deep and well-draining soils, and they're very, very fertile. Um, 
Mississippi is also a humid subtropical climate region, meaning that we're pretty warm and pretty humid. Uh, we're great for farming. Um, and the soil that we're talking about, Providence Silt Loam, is usually found on hilltops and upper hillsides with a gradient um, anywhere from zero to 15 degrees. So it's, it can be on some steep places. And that makes it particularly susceptible to erosion. So the fact that we're farming trees on it and, and pushing the topsoil away and like tearing up roots really contributes to just speeding that erosion process. And it's not a good thing. Um, but these are just some of the factors of this type of soil. So I'm going to give you the uh, group that it's in and tell you a little bit more about each characteristic as well. Um, so Providence Silt Loam is an alpha sol, and alpha sols are really, really cool um, because uh, they're fertile. They're usually found in humid areas, uh, and they're rich in aluminum, aluminum and iron oxide, so lots of pretty pigments. Uh, and another thing I like about them is that they have pretty well-defined horizons, which you can see on the um, soil profile below. So I want to talk about the other three words that you see here, um, because they all have something to do with the soil. So let's start with thermic. Uh, and thermic just refers to the annual temperature of the area, so it means that this part of the world is between 15 and 22 degrees Celsius uh, on average every year, and that our winter temperature and our summer temperature differ by at least 5 degrees Celsius. Um, our next word is oxyaquic, uh, and that just refers to the saturation and how much water is in the soil. So oxyaquic soils are saturated with water 20 plus consecutive days a year, or 30 total days a year. Um, and then our next word is fragiudolf, and this is the subgroup of the alpha sol specifically. So those first two words were descriptors, this one is the subgroup. Um, so fragiudolf, we'll break that into two parts. We'll look at udolf first, because that's the bigger subgroup of alpha sols, and that just means that it's a type of alpha sol in an udic area. And as far as I'm aware, udic just means humid, uh, which Mississippi definitely is. So now let's look at the word fragi, uh, which stems from fragipan, which is a layer of soil um, that restricts water flow and root formation. Uh, so in this type of soil, it's usually between a foot and a half to three feet deep. Um, and it's a pretty dense layer. It's hard to break through, especially with just a little hand trowel that I was using. Um, and these things are important to know in an artist practice because they can tell you um, how to relate to the soil, uh, how to collect it, and then maybe some of the best practices for how to transform it into pigment and use it in your artwork. Um, so for example, because I know alpha sols are, have a bunch of horizons and they're pretty well defined, I know I can collect a couple of different pigments from any given hole, which reduces the amount of damage that I'm doing to a given site. I don't have to move as many plants uh, or disrupt any organic life forms that are living underneath. Um, Knowing that it's an oxyaquic, uh, or even just alpha sol, again, is really useful because humid soil, moist soil, usually easier to dig up. Uh, so less disruption and, and shock to both your body and the earth as you're collecting it. Uh, and speaking of collecting, it's really important to forage in respectful and aware ways, being aware of uh, perhaps the indigenous peoples or other communities that have ties to the soil that you're harvesting. Um, yeah, so once more, uh, here's the soil profile from this part of Mississippi, you can see the several layers there. And here you can see uh, three pigments that I collected from this spot. So this first one comes from right about here. The second one is from, I think, higher up. And this third one is from down here. And it's beautiful, beautiful orange. Um, so the pigments are all, at this stage in this like picture, they've been washed, filtered of organic materials, um, dried, sifted, and like ground into a fine powder. So that's why they look beautiful on their little plates. Um, but those are kind of the base steps, at least in my practice, before I turn them into anything else. You can see that outlined again over here. Uh, and the two things that I do with, with soil pigments are I use them in clay staining or I use them in paint. So clay staining is actually really, really cool. Um, and it's something that not a ton of people do, uh, but it comes up in popularity every couple of years. So what you do first is you prepare your fabric just like you would if you were uh, dyeing it or bleaching it or doing like a tie-dye process. Um, I personally use uh, cotton fibers um, because being in Mississippi, cotton has a very deep history in this area and I like to respect the history and context of the place that I live in. Um, and then if you're going to clay stain with it, you don't mordant you don't mordant it, or I don't mordant it, you can. Um, instead, what I do is I use something called a binder or a fixative, and I use soy milk, uh, and the proteins in the soy milk help the clay pigments stick to the fabric, because clay is not a dye, it's not gonna chemically adhere, um, which is why you have to be really careful if you're gonna wash it. So with the soy milk, I immerse my fabric after it's been scoured, and I take it out and I let it dry, and I do that three or four times, because I really wanna build up the proteins that are in the fiber. Uh, at that point, um, I can add pigment to the soy milk solution and mix it up really well uh, so that it's suspended. And then I just add my, my fibers again. And I can leave it for up to a week, uh, depending on how dark you want the fabric to be. Um, I haven't really tested this to see if a day or a week is, is that different. Everyone has their own practice, but this is what I do. Um, and then once it's immersed, as long as you want it to be, you just take it out and let it dry and then you use it. I personally don't wash my fibers because it is a clay suspension and a clay stain, and I don't want to lose any depth of pigment. Um, you will still have pigment if you wash it, probably if you hand wash it especially. Um, but I want my colors to be as saturated as possible. So the second thing I do with uh, soil pigments is I turn them into paint. So to, this is a process that lots of you are gonna be familiar with, but in the interest of leveling the playing field, I just wanna list it one more time. Uh, so to turn pigments into paint, you add your pigment powder to your paint medium. Some people use acrylic or linseed oil or egg tempura or um, 
gum arabic for watercolors uh, it just depends on on your goals for your piece uh, you mix it to combine and then you mull with a glass muller um, to your desired texture i personally prefer a grittier soil because i like to know or i like the viewer at least when they see it to have a little help in making the connection that it's not just a normal paint it is a, a bio paint um, it's from the landscape that's something i really try to make clear in my pieces um, and that gets me to the end of this case study so here on the right hand side you can see the after picture of drenched in iron uh, it's been both painted and embroidered and i can walk you through my process um, so the first thing I do any time I'm going to do a piece of artwork based on a landscape is I visit the land several, several times and try to get a feel for what it's like to be in the area. Uh, then I visit my local chancery clerk's office and I trace the legal history of the area. Who owned it uh, and when did they acquire that ownership? I try to go back as far as I can. Uh, for this particular plot, I was only able to go back until 1901. Um, <sighs> And after I've collected as much information on the history of the area that I can, I return with my camera and soil collecting materials. Uh, and I usually start with soil collection and I take anywhere from five to 10 samples. I try really hard never to take more than I think I'll use uh, because I don't want to disrupt the area and I want to have respect for, for the environment that I'm trying to depict. Um, and then after I've collected soil, I'll take my camera and I'll think about how I want to frame the scene and what story I want to tell. So with this picture, I wanted to make it really clear how barren the landscape was, how destroyed it was. Um, and so I chose to frame it with these logs in front so that you could um, see both the bareness of the wood in the forefront and the bareness of the landscape in the back. And I wanted the viewer to be able to make that connection of this isn't just stripping the trees, it's stripping the land and stripping culture as well. Uh, and then once I've got the photo, I print it uh, on paper or cloth, depending on my goals. Um, this one's printed on cloth, actually. Uh, and then I think about how am I going to stitch it? I think about which areas I want to stitch, where do I want to paint? Um, and something with stitching that's important to remember is that even once you've stained with clay, which is a pretty matte medium, um, you're going to have some reflectivity with the thread because it's, the fibers are, are bound and woven in, in a way that is reflective. Um, so I try to be conscious of the way that the light will reflect uh, as a means of calling attention to a given area. So for this piece, the areas that are uh, embroidered are the bare spots on the bark. And I know this is a low resolution picture, uh, so you can see the, the image um, higher and where you can zoom in. Uh, by following some of these links down here, but I'll talk more about that in a minute. So I embroidered the bare bark of these trees and then this one, um, and then I thought about also too where I wanted to paint, um, because I have this nice diagonal line with the embroidery, so I tried to do the same thing with, with the paint. I wanted to cover the sky with the clay to change the tone of the scene and really like draw in on the somber uh, mood that I'm trying to convey, the barrenness, the lack of hope, because I took the picture on a beautiful sunny blue sky day. Um, and then there's also some clay painting just to highlight the little grasses and some of the sticks down here to give me another diagonal through line and balance the image. But I really wanted to call attention again to a sense of barrenness, to, to make it clear what we're doing to the environment when we go through this pine plantation process. Um, and I tried to make that clear through both my color and the direction and density of my stitches. So the stitches are all straight, there aren't very many curves, and they just follow the lines of the tree because I want your eye to be drawn back towards this empty barren spot. Um, so like I said, if you want to see this piece in more depth, you can follow tinyurl.com slash overpainting. I'll put up a, a high resolution picture of it and some detail shots of the thread. Oh, side note about the thread, um, some of it is clay stained and then some of it is commercially um, commercially purchased thread. I do that because some of the shadows are blue or purple or green and that's a little bit higher, harder to get from clays and soils in this area. Um, so just in the entrance of like transparency. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, you can see it and detail shots at tinyurl.com slash overpainting. You can go to my website, which is a work in progress. I'm a student artist and I just started. Uh, but it's samacollective.com. You can follow me on Instagram, sama underscore stitches, where I post my progress pictures, my studio shots, uh, what I'm working on, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me at sydneymatrishano2022 at u.northwestern.edu, which I swear is the world's longest email address. And then if you're interested in any of the citations of this poster, uh, or yeah, the citations uh, and then the images can also be seen by following this QR code, depending on how you're viewing um, this presentation. So thank you so much for your attention. I've really enjoyed our time together. Please reach out if you have any questions, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Pigments Revealed Symposium. Thank you.